Hello and welcome back to another tutorial. Wow, it's only been a week, but it feels like a complete year since I created a tutorial. Now this one just keeps giving. So here we're going to deploy uh, Django onto Heroku using a Docker image. So I'm going to take you through a, a story here. I'm going to take you through a process um, which you can skip some of these sections if you want to. Now, if you want to just uh, go ahead and just uh, actually deploy to Heroku, you've got everything else set up, then just go to the timeline and have a look at doing that. Now, the process here or the coverage or the workflow here is we're going to create a new project. That isn't going to take long. We're literally just going to build a simple Django. Uh, we're just literally going to load the default Django project. Now, once you've done that, I'll take you through the idea of environment variables. So this is an important step that I want to kind of give some information about and why it's important and how to work with environment variables. And then we're actually going to use those environment variables. I'm going to show you how to use environment variables with Heroku at the end. And then I'm going to take you through settings or configuring your Django settings in a kind of granular way. Um, breaking up your settings into smaller files. So I'll take you through that type of process. That can be useful to manage your settings file in your Django project. We will also be deploying our files, our static files onto AWS. So I'll quickly go through how to configure AWS to set up the static files of your project. And then once we've done all that, we'll then go ahead and create a Docker file. So what we're going to do essentially, and you can use your own application, is create a very kind of simple baseline Docker file so that we can uh, create a, a Docker image of your application. So in the previous tutorials, I kind of showed you how to create volumes. So you could work on your, your image or your container simultaneously. Um, and that isn't necessarily the best way of working or preferred way of working. It might be that you work locally and then when you're ready, you then kind of dockerize your application, make an image. So this is basically that. So once you've finished creating your application locally, you're going to create a Docker file and then create a Docker image. So I'm going to take you through that process and then we're going to test it. And then I'll just show you how to upload that to Docker Hub so that you can share it with anyone else if you want to. The final step, once you've done that, is to then actually deploy our image to Heroku. So uh, Heroku will work with Docker to create an image, um, a, an individual image, a, a separate image to then actually deploy onto Heroku. Now this is really simple. It's probably easier deploying an image to Heroku than it is setting up a, a normal Django application on Heroku. So we'll go through that process and then I'm going to take you through how to set environment configurations on your application in Heroku. And that will be pretty much it. By the end of this tutorial, Hopefully you have a much better idea about deploying your application using Docker images to Heroku. And then saying that, once you've got an image and you understand this process a little bit more, you can also obviously deploy your images to other uh, services like AWS service, for example. So what you're going to find in the project folder or the project product repository is a commands text file. And here is pretty much all the commands that I'm going to be utilizing and just some links to different resources to help you out in this tutorial. So you can go ahead and utilize your own project. Of course, you can do this, um, but we're just going to quickly build a virtual environment and just install. You can see we're just going to create a, a simple Django project. So we'll go ahead and create our virtual environment. And then we just need to move into that and fire it up. So now we've done that, we can uh, pip install Django. Like I said, we're just building a, a a standalone simple project so that we can dockerize it and deploy it to Heroku. So now Django is installed and let's just go ahead and copy and paste this, speed up a little bit. So this will create a new project called core. Inside of here we have settings. Don't forget the dot to denote that I want the project to be appear in here, not create a new folder. And then the project inside of that folder. So you can go ahead and just check to see that's working. So it looks like it's working OK. So that's all right. We'll close that with, in my case, Control and C. And then if you're not too familiar with pip freeze, uh, this is going to be needed. So this will create a file called requirements.txt. And you can see that these are all the dependencies or the applications that have been installed to actually run this project. So if you're not familiar with this, this is really handy, of course, when you 
want to replicate your project because you can save this and then for example I can download your project and run the requirements and that will install all the different dependencies and the correct versions of those dependencies that will run your project. So I wanted to introduce this idea if you're not too familiar with this the idea of configurable environment variables. So if we go into the core and settings this is where you'll generally find most of the core variables or settings for your project. Um, and of course these are generally static configurations um, but sometimes you want to make them a little bit more dynamic in that maybe you want to select and choose your environment variables when you actually load up your application. So I suppose traditionally what you would do you'd have to go in here and you'd configure this one you'd move down here configure this one and so on and that could take a little bit of a long time and it also causes the chance or creates the chance of making a mistake and maybe you forget to actually apply a setting. So I begin by describing these configurable environment variables as a way of creating maybe a file where we could then actually define all our variables environment variables in one place and obviously that makes it a lot easier to maintain. So instead of having secret key variable here and then some other kind of variables down here that we would use for our project um, why not just put them all into one place and then refer to them actually in this file. So let's go ahead in this core project folder here where the settings file is we're going to just create a new file and we're going to call this .env. Okay so this is a an environment file. So this env file all it is really is a, a simple configuration text file. So here we're going to just define some variables um, that we want to pass into our application environment. So like I was kind of describing to you say we didn't have a secret key here uh, maybe we set out a placeholder. So if you look at the commands here I've given you a, a method here so for example our secret key we can set this up with a os.getemv uh, so we go ahead and do that and this is basically referencing a, a variable that's going to be found within our environment file. So what we can do now is simply just go over to our environment file and go into Django for example to set out Django and then define the secret key this way and obviously then this will be connected to the settings file here and that will then populate the secret key in the settings file. So hopefully you can start to see some of the benefits here already. It's, a lot e it's going to be a lot easier to configure your project this way um, and like I said there's going to be fewer production mistakes um, because we can define all of our settings here if we want to change them and then maybe inject new settings into our project then we can do that through defining new environment variables. So this is probably worth its own slide here so environment variables if you already aware of what these are and have a good idea then please skip to the next step but I just wanted to say a few things about this to kind of clear this up environment variables so I've given you an example or we've seen um, a basic uh, example here so you've got a general idea of what's happening here so instead of us using sensitive information inside of our application here and then remember this sensitive information here this secret key or maybe our API keys or passwords they will be set normally in settings so this is a file that's actually stored on our on our file server or our server sorry our web server so that anyone could then go into our web server and just access this file and obtain that information. So when I say anyone let's remember that maybe you're working in teams you may have 50 other developers that you're working with so you don't want everyone to have all these credentials or, or have access to these credentials and maybe that's just kind of obvious reasons you know someone leaves the company and all of a sudden that person knows every key or is has been exposed to every single password every single key inside of your company or inside your application so it means that you need to kind of rotate those keys again every time someone leaves the company. So by creating this idea of environment variables it could possibly mean that maybe only the most senior personal manager 
knows the actual keys and actually applies or injects the keys into the into the program so that everyone else can continue working with the softwares, etc., um, without having to actually know the uh, production credentials. So that's the important bit. That an environment variable is a variable whose value is set outside of the program and it's not accessible um, like it would be in a file system. So we created an EMV file here. So this isn't something that we're going to check into the version control system, GitHub, etc. cetera. Um, so while we're working here, um, while we're working uh, locally here, um, on a machine, we've got this EMV file, and that's just for convenience at the moment, so that we can kind of point things to our application. That's how we're using it at the moment. But this isn't going to be uploaded to um, GitHub. This isn't going to be loaded onto your web server. We're going to inject these uh, keys, these environment variables, into our software as we deploy the software. So behind the scenes. Um, these variables, uh, well, let's just say they're managed by the operating system of your of your server. And every any time that we want to call them, you can see here that we're potentially going to use OS get EMV. And that's going to go into the, uh, I'll say this loosely, our operating system that our server has. And it's going to grab those environment variables that we've set. So they're not going to be stored. These environment variables, they're not going to be stored on a file system anywhere. They're going to be stored behind the scenes. Uh, on the managed by the operating system. So that might sound a little bit abstract to you. Hopefully you got the, the general idea of what's going on here with environment variables. And I'll give you an example of injecting some variables in when we create some Docker images later in the tutorial. But here's a, that's a kind of a general overview and hopefully that was useful to kind of start in point to understand environment variables. A good place to start if you're new to environment variables is just installing uh, pip install Django environ. So let's just go ahead and install this. So please do go ahead and read the documentation. Essentially what this is doing, and as it suggests, it's just kind of wrapping or unifying a lot of different packages um, to potentially make this a simpler, easier environment to, to work with the, the environment variables in your application. Now, one thing that will come to light is this idea of the 12 factor app methodology um, for building software as a service applications. So these are just some best practices um, to help you design better software. Now, one of these practices here is um, number three, the config. So configuration that varies between deployments should be stored in the environment. And that's exactly what we're doing here now. So to give kind of quantify that a little bit more. So you may be developing in a, an environment, a local environment. And of course, you've got your local database um, keys. You've got your local other software keys and maybe using an API locally, et cetera. So you're developing this locally. You're going to have different environment variables. So I'm referring to these database keys and passwords and usernames as environment variables. Of course, when you convert that into a production, uh, when you uh, put that onto a live server, then your database there might have a completely different username and password. So as I kind of keep reiterating this point, these environment variables can be easily changed um, through managing through one simple text file, the EMV file, or else they can be injected in um, once you deploy the application. So it just makes uh, life a lot of it a lot easier um, to deploy and to manage your uh, application in this way. And of course, it provides a good level of security as I've previously explained. Okay, so now I probably said way too much about that. Let's just go ahead and add some different environment variables. Uh, again, this is just for demonstration. You may have more here. Um, we're going to be utilizing AWS shortly, so we'll add some more to that. So you can see we've got a secret key for application, debug equals true, and the allowed hosts, we've also set that up too. So uh, let's just go ahead and let's just change this. So we're going to have uh, the secret key set. So we're going to not use get EMV, 
anymore. So we're going to change that to uh, EMV. Uh, so let's just go ahead and do that because our application is going to, that we've just installed is going to manage that. And then we obviously want the debug. So we change that to debug EMV debug. So the debug here is the actual name, this reference point to the actual variable here. And then we have the value. Notice that the value doesn't have single or double quotes. Um, so that's set up. And then we let's do the allowed hosts. So what we've got here is multiple hosts. So what we're going to need to do is take this and to this is going to be a string um, returned as a string. So we're going to need to separate this um, up so that we can change it into the right format for the allowed hosts. So it's going to look a bit like this. So allowed host refers to uh, allowed host here. And then we've got two items here. So what we've done is we've used split and we're going to split it uh, where the comma is. So that just indicates that we've got uh, another item after the comma in the string. And that's then going to format in the correct manner. So what we have now, hopefully, is if we run the server, um, you can see here it says um, error name EMV is not defined. So secondly, what we need to do um, is just configure the application that we installed. Uh, and that will be um, here if you if you need instructions, I presume it's going to be somewhere here. Um, there we go. So we've got some two settings here um, that we need to include. So let's go ahead and do that. So you can see here we've got this uh, default value um, or default values that can be set and then overridden. So we can definitely go ahead and set default values. And obviously, um, if we do have environment variables, they will be overridden. So that's essentially what you're, you're seeing here in this section here. So we don't actually need anything in here. And we can just rely solely on the settings that we define. Of course, there are some times where you want to set environment variables like this because that's pretty safe, isn't it, in terms of a security measure. Yeah, that's not really something that isn't or can't be shared with other members of a team. Obviously, secret keys and passwords, you probably won't want to set something up initially. And you can see here, this is going to read the actual um, EMV file. So that's the two commands that are needed and obviously the import. So let's just put that up there. And there we go. So that should now work. So let's go ahead and run the server again. And you can see that the server is running. So you can check that. Um, for example, if we were just to change this to that, and you can see that we've got um, the environment variables not configured properly. So that just confirms the fact that we are now taking values uh, into our settings file from the environment file. Next up, we're going to talk about granularizing our settings file. So Django allows us to actually, um, or Django will actually look for a settings file or a settings folder. So we can define a settings folder. Uh, so let's go ahead and create a new folder. We're just going to call this uh, settings. And then inside of our settings folder, we can put our settings. So we're going to kind of need to initiate, initiate this folder. Uh, so we're going to need an init file in here. So let's go ahead and do that. We've got the double uh, init.py. OK, so that means that Django will look for files in this folder. And now we can just go ahead and basically tell Django what file to look for. So from uh, dot settings, uh, import. And then, oh, OK, so let's go ahead and try and start our server up again. And you can see that we've got set the secret key environment variable. Um, that doesn't look like it's working. OK, so what we need to do is just move the EMV file into settings for now. Um, OK, so let's just try that again. There we go. So now everything is working OK. Something else to just tell you, you can see here that the base directory, the path file dot resolve is dot parent dot parent. And that's basically uh, moving back in the file and folder structure by using dot parent dot parent. So if we were to go ahead now, let me just show you, let's uh, move this down. So if I were to go ahead 
just delete the existing database. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a PY. Uh, let's just do the initial migrate. And notice that the database doesn't actually now appear where it should be inside of this um, area here in the root directory. That's because it's defined as parent.parent. .parent. So if I go into the core, you'll now see that the database is here. So what you need to also do if you want to kind of set up and utilize this is redefine the base directory. So what we can do is just add another parent here. So that means it's going to travel back, back, and then back again. And that should now refer to the base directory. So let's just go ahead and uh, delete this. Um, and then just run the, the command again. I spelled that wrong. So we now have the database in the root directory as needed. So let's go ahead and have a look at our settings again. So I've gone ahead and created a new file called local dev because now we've got this set up here. One way of working is that we can now set different setting files for different uh, situations. So maybe we're working locally, so we want a different settings file for local machine. So as I said before, maybe you don't use an environment variable here. Uh, maybe you're just setting this up for the local database and so on. And then of course your production environment, you want to use an environment variable. So you set up a different settings file for that. And of course in your init file here, what you'll do is you'll just comment out um, the, the settings file that you don't want to use. And of course now we're just using local dev, which was just a copy. So let's just go ahead to see if we can run that. And you can see that it works utilizing the local dev file. So I have seen other people work in a different way in that they basically set out this in a really kind of modular way. So they would have a file here for, for example, storage. So let's just go ahead because we are going to be creating some or connecting some storage in a minute. So let's just create a, a storage file here. And basically this is going to have all the storage um, environment. So what would happen is in your settings, so I'm just going to get rid of this file here and then just remove it. So what we're going to have also is now uh, storage here. And then what we can do with that is that we can go over to the settings, uh, find our storage. I don't think we've uh, set that up just yet, or maybe just the static. And then we can then go ahead and just put it right here. So as long as that's saved, so the static doesn't isn't dependent upon anything. So we don't need to import anything here because you'll need to manually import um, everything again. Uh, so let's go ahead and just try that out. That seems to be working. Obviously we can't test that, but there we go. So we now have two files, one dedicate, dedicated to storage and one with all the, the, the other settings for our Django package. So you probably got the idea already. Uh, that's just something that you can work with now in your Django project. So next up is stage four. This is where we're going to uh, create a an AWS configuration. Um, you don't need to potentially do this step. You can just use a, the local storage. But of course, we're going to Dockerize this application. We're then going to deploy it to Heroku. So we want a way of connecting our application to some storage. So generally, we're going to use um, cloud storage for our application. So we're just going to set up a simple AWS uh, S3 bucket and create a new policy create a new user, and then just go ahead and create uh, some settings for that. So let's go ahead and do that next. So like I said, if you haven't got an AWS account, don't worry, just use the local storage, but I'll just quickly take you through this. And of course you can skip this section in the timeline if you want to. So go ahead and create a new account if you don't already have one, or else just sign into the console if you're if you're new to this and you don't know how to set this up. So I want to sign in as the root user. So I'll meet you inside the dashboard. So from here, first of all, we're going to set up a new S3 bucket. So uh, you can see that we've got recently visited. If you don't, you can just type in S3 here. If you don't want to do that, you can go to the services and storage S3 or type in S3 here. Either way, we're going to be utilizing the S3 storage facility. So let's just create a new bucket. So we're going to just call this Django for now. And then you can select your region. Um, and then what we need to do is deselect block all public access because obviously 
we're going to be storing CSS files here and JavaScript files, etc. So we don't want it to be blocked to all public. Um, otherwise, they won't be able to access them. And that's about it that we need to do there for now. You can enable encryption if you want to. But we're going to create a, a simple baseline bucket here. Um, so that already exists. So let's just call that Django123. And I must click that box there. And then you can create the bucket. So we now have our actual storage that we can utilize. So now let's go ahead and create a new policy for this. So this is all going to work as, as it is pretty much. So, um, but we want to create a, a new policy and a, a new user because at the moment, what we don't want to do is we're logged in as the admin. We don't want to use the admin at any point in time to access any resources, whether that be a database, um, whether it be Django. So um, try and always utilize the admin user as someone who's going to perform administrative tasks and not as a way of allowing an application to access a resource. So here in AWS, we can set up um, po different policies for different users and we can set up individual users. So <clears throat> let's just uh, start by going over to the IAM service. So this is going to allow us to create some users. Um, in that sense, we can create some policies here as well. So let's just create a new policy first. Uh, so let's go ahead and press create. Now what we can do here is we can utilize this click and select type of uh, way of creating a policy, um, or we can just do this manually utilizing JSON here. So if you have a look at the project in the commands here, I've uh, copied and pasted a script now for you to utilize. So we're just going to put that right there. So you can see what's happening here is that this policy is going to allow a user access only to S3 and then the resource inside of it. So we called our resource Django123. Uh, so this is going to be a little bit more specific in terms of what this user can access. So you can see here that we are defining the actual bucket and all the folders that are inside of that bucket and only that bucket. So this user utilizing this policy, if we attach this policy to a user, this user will only be able to access these resources. So that's just making things a little bit more secure. Okay, so we can go ahead and just review the policy. Um, we'll give it a name. So we'll just call this Django S3. Um, that's pretty much all that we need to do there. Um, so you can see what access is being provided, limited, list, read, write, permissions, management, tag-in. And then we create the policy. So now we can go ahead and create a new user. So let's do that. And then let's add a, a new user. We're just going to call this Django. And um, we're going to give this programmatic access. So we don't want to give this user access to the AWS Management Console. This is just purely for an access, allow access from an application to S3. So pro program, programmatic access. And then next. And then here, what we can do is attach it to an existing policy. So we can do that by searching for Django. We called it Django S3. So we we'll select that, press next. And then there's some optional tags, but we can ignore that. Press next and then just check, review that, and then press create user. And there we go. So what's going to happen now is this user, this is the access user. This is the, um, this is the credentials. This user has the credentials that allows our program to access S3. So at this point, what we need to do is just record our access key. And then in addition to that, just show your secret key. So I'm just going to copy and paste that onto my document here. Uh, there we go. So I now have my ID and key that I'm going to be utilizing for um, accessing S3 through that user. Okay. So there's going to be a little bit of a setup here for this. So we're going to need to install some packages that's going to allow us to actually interface with S3 and utilize it within Django. So let's go ahead and just close that server. We pip install Django storages. So this is going to give us um, kind of a, a wrapper around some other tools that are going to allow us then to access 
uh, all different types of storage storages online. So let's go ahead and install that. Uh, once that's done, you're also going to need the pip install Boto3. Again, so this is just a tool that's going to allow us to connect to external sources and manage it within our Django package. Okay, so once we've got that, I'm just going to do a pip freeze again. Uh, so we can see what's now installed in this project. So you can see there's quite a few different things now. We've got uh, the Boto Core, Boto Core 3. Um, we installed Django Environ earlier. So you can see that all the different items we now have installed that make up this program or allow this program to run. So what we're going to need to do now is a little bit of configuration in our settings file. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. So first of all, we just need to register our storage application that we installed. So that's really simple. It's just called uh, storages. Um, so that's that done. We don't need anything for the uh, Boto. Um, so let's go ahead and just check that. Okay, so let's go ahead now and just close all this up. We're going to now just configure, configure our storage. So uh, just do this uh, line by line. Um, so like I said earlier, because we're using, utilizing this file here as an individual file, so we're going to need to go ahead and do the same, same type of things here and uh, import all of our different dependencies that we're going to need um, as we work, as if we were going to create our settings file. Um, so uh, I think all I'm going to need here is probably OS. So let's just see how we get on. Let's just see how we get in. So let's just import OS. Um, so uh, what we're going to need to do is import the environment variables because we're going to be utilizing environment variables here. So let's go ahead and just do that. So those are the two lines of code that we need to kind of connect up to our environment variables. And now what we need to do is configure uh, Boto3. So we just basically uh, define the fact that we're going to be utilizing S3. So Boto is going to provide all kind of the backend tools that is going to allow us to connect to S3 and actually then perform all the operations that we need. So now we're going to configure AWS. So we're going to need um, our access keys to begin with. So let's go ahead and uh, define that. So here you can see we're setting up an environment variable, which we're going to define shortly. And then second to that, we need the AWS secret key. So those are the two keys that we accessed earlier. So we obviously need to define what bucket we want to access. So let's go ahead and do that. So that was just the AWS storage bucket name. Again, we use the environment variable for that. And then we're going to set a default ACL. So access control list. So here we can define a default access control list for our, for our folder. So have a look at, if you just type in AWS default ACL, have a look and through at the different options that are available that might be suited to your project. This is going to just allow um, other applications to, and for example, a user will go to your website and then they obviously need to download all the JavaScript files and all the static files to their browser. And public read means that they will be able to access that file and download it to their machine. So public read. So next up, we will configure our uh, custom domain that's just kind of needed to kind of connect things up. Um, because obviously what we want to have is on our application, we're going to link to our storage. So our storage needs to be linked to the AWS storage. So we need to set up all these custom kind of domains so that we can point our application files to the right place so people can download the files. Of course, there's a range of other settings that we can apply. So for example, we can define the cache control, for example. Um, so we can cache items and potentially speed up the process. Um, so that are other, are those are other type of things that we can do. Now, we will also define the folder we want to make and actually store the files on our bucket because although we created a bucket and we might want individual folders for different items that we want to store. So we're going to store the static files here only. So let's just create a, a static folder. So everything that we store at the moment is going to be placed inside of static and then whatever files are created by our application inside of that. And then we've got then the static URL that needs to be set. 
again, so that our files will point to the right place um, because we're creating a static folder here. So it just means that, for example, if someone goes to your website, they're downloading all the JS files and CSS files, and this is kind of directing them where those files will be. So that just then leaves us to set the Django static files directory. And there we go. So that should be our settings now configured. Now, obviously, we've got a, a range of different environment variables here. So let's just go into our EMV file again and have a look at changing some of these variables. So I think there are three things that we've defined. Uh, we've got the access key and the bucket name. So they're just these three things that we need to define. So if we go back into EMV, uh, let's just set that up. So let's just start by uh, just defining AWS here. So white space doesn't matter. That isn't a problem. So first of all, we had our access key that we need to define. Then we had the, the secret access key. And then finally, we had the storage bucket name. Okay, so the storage bucket name was uh, Django123 and the access and secret keys I saved right here. I copied them across when we created the new user. So let's just go ahead and do that. So the longer is for the secret access key. So that should now provide us access. So now we have that set up, it should now be configured. So let's go ahead and do a py manage py. And then we're going to obviously then perform the task where we actually create all the static files. So that's going to be collect static. Okay, so you can see we've got an error. Um, name path is not defined. Okay, so that was, um, again, just some of these dependencies that we need to import in. So here, for example, you can see that we've, from pathlib, we're utilizing path. So let's just go back into our storage and add that there so that our path works. Um, I should just check while we're here. I think it was just uh, OS that we're using. So I think that's already in in path. So let's just give that a go again. So environ is not defined. So we also need to uh, bring in environ. This time, yep. Okay, so now we've got a win error free. The system cannot find path specified. So let's just now stop that. Um, let's just double check. We've in the settings, we've still not got static there. No. Okay, so let's go ahead and create a new folder called static. Okay, so this time it looks like it's doing something. So hopefully what's happening now is all those files, static files, um, in this case, it's going to be all the kind of admin CSS files that are gonna be needed to style the admin on your server. That's gonna be copied across hopefully to AWS. So let's just go back into AWS. Um, let's go back to our services. And then go to our bucket. Inside of our bucket, you can see we have now a folder called static that's just been created. And we now have all these static files that have just been generated by Django. So clearly that is all working now. So we can further test this by, because we aren't now actually utilizing that, those files, we can further test that by just going ahead and uh, run the server. And then let's just go into the the server here, uh, oh, 127. Uh, if we go into the admin, which I haven't actually set up, so let's go ahead and do that. So let's just create a super user. Oh, oh what did I do? Create super user. So what we should be able to do is actually see the files being linked to AWS. 
So we just run the server again. So when we go back in and then just log into app, well, we'll probably do it here in actual fact, but uh, if we just go into the, the source here, you can see that we're actually being linked here to the AWS, so Django123, that's our bucket, S3, Amazon AWS service, uh, static admin base. So you can see that our web page is now being served from AWS. Okay, so part five, next up, Gunnerhorn. Okay, so as you've seen there, um, Django has a lightweight server that we can run in production or in development just to test to see if it works or not. Um, and obviously you're not going to run that in production. So one of the packages that you might run instead is Gunnerhorn. So what we're going to do is just go through that process. We're just going to pip install Gunnerhorn, uh, which is a, a server package that we can utilize in a production server um, for to allow us to uh, serve Django from that server. Uh, so let's just go ahead and just save that in our requirements. So that's pretty much all we're going to do there. Now what we're going to do is start thinking about dockerizing. So this is where I say you finish making your project, everything's running in production, sorry, on your development server, and now you want to take this to production, or at least you want to test this maybe on a server. So the next process we go through, I'm just going to show you how to create a simple Docker file to create an image of your application. And then I'm going to show you how to upload that to uh, Docker Hub so you can keep that and maybe then utilize that to deploy on different services. And then we're going to go ahead and actually deploy onto Heroku using this container that we build. So we're going to need a Docker file. So let's go ahead and create a Docker file. Um, be careful with the capitalization and the fact that there is no file extension for this. Okay, so this is a Docker file. So in here, we're going to just define exactly what we're going to um, build. So here, essentially, sorry, what we're going to do is we're going to build a Docker image based upon our application. Okay, so what's going to happen is we're going to Dockerize our application, make it into an image so we can then use that image to deploy onto different servers if we want to. And of course, that then makes it more shareable. So others can just download that image and then just run that image. And they'll be running exactly the same environment as our application is running here. Obviously, there's many benefits of that. So let's go ahead first and apologies for not typing this in. I'm just copying and pasting this in. But it just means I can explain it more effectively uh, because I'm not very good at typing and talking. So. Uh, from Python. So the first step here, dockerizing this, is we're going to define what version of Python and uh, what operating system we want to utilize for our application. So if you go over to the Docker Hub, um, if you're not familiar with this, uh, let's go to, and then let's just type in, for example, uh, let's go to explore. I'm logged in. Um, so let's go to uh, Python. So this is the um, official Python image. So let's go into Python. You can see that just going through here, there's lots of different versions. So it's basically just selecting what version of Python that you want to, to run your image in. So what's going to happen is that Docker is going to download this image and then it's going to put your files inside of this image and then create a new image from that. And then what you have then is a, a contained operating system with your package within it. So let's just go back. Uh, so that's what I've selected. No particular reason, I've just selected that version. So what we want to do first is just copy across the text, uh, the requirement text file, because that's going to be really useful here. Because remember what we're doing is we're making an operating system uh, so we're going to need to deploy our application onto it. Therefore, we're going to need to know what uh, software we're going to need to install. And this requirements text defines that. So let's first of all go ahead and just copy across. So these are commands that we're going to be utilizing or Docker's going to be utilizing. This is kind of a setup script. So we're going to copy across the requirements text to a new folder. We're going to build a new folder called app. And then it's going to copy across the requirements to that folder. That's what's going to happen to begin with. So we now have a new operating system and a new file with a new folder um, ready to go. 
So what we can now do is we can configure the server. So now we've got this application running, we've copied this across. We Essentially what we're doing is making a new operating system, or sorry, making a new um, platform, making a new computer with an operating system on. Uh, so we're just configuring it. And that's pretty much all that's happening. So what we can do is we can uh, run some commands and then these commands can be chained together. So typically what's the first thing you do when you uh, start, you would potentially um, upgrade pip. Maybe that's the first thing that you do. So this is a simple command that we can run that will be run automatically when we create this image. Uh, so we're just going to upgrade pip to make sure it's, we've got the, the latest version. So we, what we can then do um, is install our application or so our, our application from the requirements text. So we just go ahead and do that. So pip install, and you can see here it goes into the app folder and then goes into the requirements text. So next thing we're gonna do is just define the working directory. And essentially what that means, or one of the things that that's going to mean is that when you go into this image, your container, that's gonna take you directly to this application folder or the working folder. So in addition to that, it just provides us a way of then saying, okay, we're gonna be working from that folder. And essentially now we're just saying, well, any other command here now, we can, we know we're gonna be working from that folder. So for example, what we want to do now is we want to copy all of our stuff across to the image. So we've created a new container, so a new image with this, uh, with Python installed and uh, we've got Linux Alpine version 3.12 installed, a lightweight Linux version. We've then copied across our text file to this file folder here, which has been created. And then we've just basically on our, on our new machine, we've inst upgraded pip if it needed to be upgraded. And we've just copied across our file Oh, sorry, we've inst sorry, we've installed our requirements text file. So that's going to go ahead and install all those applications within that requirements text. Okay, so next thing that's happened is that we're saying, okay, now we want to go to that folder. So we're now inside of that folder. Uh, so what we want to do now is we want to copy our um, contents over to it because we want to obviously run our application. So that's really simple. We can use add or copy. So there's two commands, add and copy, and it's worth um, reading through that rather than me explaining what add and copy does. Um, it's worth explaining, sorry, it's worth reading through that if you're going to be utilizing Docker quite regularly. Um, so you're using the right command at the right time. Okay, so once that's done, uh, we can then go ahead and just set up Gunnerhorn. So there's a few ways of doing this, right? So um, obviously what we've done now is we've set up our application and now we want to run our application like we're doing here. Basically we're running our application. Um, so we can do that by setting a command. So here we're using Gunnerhorn. So if I wanted to use Gunnerhorn here, um, remember this is a windows machine, so I can't really, um, show you this unfortunately, but I can just type in Gunnerhorn and uh, then, um, these commands here to actually run Gunnerhorn on this computer, uh, in this development environment. Uh, but like I said, on Windows, that isn't possible. So um, obviously here we're using Linux inside of this container. So I define Gunnerhorn and then I'm binding the 8000 port so I can access it through 8000 port. And then I've got, uh, I'm utilizing three workers, which uh, is just an arbitrary number. You can have four, five, six. If you're interested in what that means, then just have a quick read through that. And then it's going to be a WSGI application. So I just define that. Okay. So in addition to that, I just need to potentially expose uh, the port so that we can make this available and, and kind of bind this across. So when I actually typed 8,000 port into my browser, it will then take me to this application, which is obviously running in the container. Okay. So that's done there. Now this isn't a, Heroku configuration. Heroku doesn't allow you to expose 8,000. And in addition to that, Heroku, we need to kind of configure this slightly differently for Heroku. Um, but I'll show you that shortly. This is just going to uh, create the image. And so we can kind of see this working to begin with. And then once we know everything is working okay, we'll then export that to, uh, or deploy that to Heroku and just change these configurations slightly. 
But that's um that's good to go, I think. So we can go ahead now and build our image. Okay, so as I keep saying, I'm working in Windows here. Um, I've installed the Docker uh, dashboard here. You can see the images that I have. I don't have any containers running at the moment. So everything is running here fine. So obviously you're going to need to have this working to perform this. So this would work the same. These commands work pretty much the same on all operating systems. So obviously I want to make an image. So I need to type in Docker and then uh, we want to build a new image. Uh, so let's go ahead and do Django, call this Django core. And then this is version one. So that's what we're going to call it. So what will happen now is that we'll build a new image. And then obviously when we build this image, and we've already defined the instructions for this. These are all the instructions. So it's going to download this if we don't already have this downloaded. It's going to copy this file across. It's going to run those commands. It's going to copy across all your files and then it's going to expose and then potentially run the server with Gunnyhorn. And then we should be able to access our application through port 8000. Now let's see if this works. So let's go ahead and just build our application. So this might take uh, a few seconds. Uh, what have I done wrong there? Okay, so we're going to need the dot at the end. There we go. Uh, so just referring to uh, dot the file system. So this file system here. Um, so you can see what's happening here is any dependencies that it needs, it would be downloading. Um, if you obviously this is very quick, um, but it's what's happening here is that it's now running through uh, these commands and it's installing all the um, applications that we need. Um, it's, it's named the Docker uh, file to Django Core V1. And now when we do a, um, a Docker, and then obviously we can look at the images by typing in images, you can see we have a new image here called Django Core. The tag is V1. Okay, so there we go. So we've just created our new image. Now remember this is an image, so if we go back into our container, you can see that it's not running. Um, so I can go ahead and just uh, press run here to run this. However, that will probably not work. So let's have a look here. Um, oh, actually it might run. So let's, let's just give this a go. So I thought I set this up slightly differently. So let's just uh, press run. Now you can see when we press run here, we've got a different options, but let's just go for a run. So you can see it's working. Let's have a look at the CLI. Um, you can see that we're, we're, we've been placing the slash app because that was the working directory. So I can list, remember we're now working in Linux, so it's LS. So you can see that we have all our files here um, that we have in our, in our projects. These are all our project files, uh, which is all good. So that's all good. Uh, let's just go ahead and just uh, just test this out, shall we? Um, there we go. So it obviously isn't working. So the reason why that is because we actually haven't um, bound the ports to it. So although the ports of it are exposed, as I previously mentioned, we need to kind of bind our port of our machine uh, to to the Docker. Um, container so that we can pass through port 8000 and be able to access the container. So let's just uh, stop that. So let's go ahead and just uh, let's just remove this container. Uh, so we've still got the image ready. So we're bring up the image again. So let's go back into our Docker file. So what we're going to need to do is just run a few commands. So obviously, I say obviously. Um, so we run use a run command to run an image. And then we just need to define the ports. So we're going to bind the 8000 port on our machine to the 8000 port of the container. So that's going to pass through. And then we just need to then define well, what container we want to start, or in this case, run. So it was the Django core. And uh, what do we call it? Uh, uh, version 1, I guess. Or, yeah, version 1. So let's go ahead and just double check that again. Uh, V1, yep. Okay, so let's have a go. So it looks like everything is up. You can see here it says it's listening at HTTP 0008000. Uh, it started the gunny horn. 
uh, server and so it looks like it's all working so let's go back into our browser and refresh and there we go so we're now accessing our Django application inside of our docker container so of course we haven't actually made an application we've just installed Django this is why we're seeing this so obviously your application should now be running within this container so this next step is just a, an added step just to show you how to do this so we have a new image that we've created now that's obviously uh, stored locally at the moment we might want to share that with others or store it in our docker hub here so i'm logged into docker so if you wanted to do that and of course make it shareable uh what we can do is type in docker uh let's just type in docker image images first so you can see that doc, uh, the django core is there that's the image we created so go ahead and docker login now there might be a few steps you need to take i'm already logged in so that isn't a problem uh, so what we need to do now is actually let's create a a new instance and then let's update or upload this so um, let's go ahead and say docker uh, tag so django core uh, v1 so that's what we're working on at the moment that's kind of our our working build um, uh, let's just uh, create a new kind of build uh, so this is going to be uh, Django core we're going to call this latest and it's that that we're going to basically upload to docker hub so we do that first there we go so now if we go back into here you can see uh, we have now this new um, instance here we literally just made a, a copy it's called latest so this is the one we're working on say or developing and this is obviously the latest build the one we want to actually deploy or we want to use or upload to docker hub so now all we need to do is push this so we just say docker uh, push and then we just tell docker what we want to push so in this case uh, very academy dash django core and then the latest version okay so that's going to push it up uh, so that'll take a few seconds that's what 200 meg and eventually all that's going to happen is it will appear here in your repositories okay so once that's done if we go back and refresh our docker hub you can see there we go there's our image that we can utilize and other people can download you can see it's public at the moment you can have public and private images uh, which you can share so anyone now in the world can download potentially this image so uh, now we've done that now let's concentrate on actually deploying our image to heroku so the first step is that we just need to go back into our docker file and make a few changes now remember this is just like a baseline document here there's many more things you might want to add to this i just wanted to to show you kind of a baseline and then you can work from there so hopefully you can see what's happening so far we've literally just been working locally we've created a docker file now and then we've made a docker image so we can run it in docker and now we've got our image in place we're now happy that that works we tested our image locally we're happy and now we want to actually deploy this so this is just an example utilizing heroku of course we could deploy this potentially anywhere which um, allows us to deploy images um so first thing we need to do is uh, as i said earlier um exposing the 8000 port on heroku that isn't going to work for us so we can just comment that out so i don't think heroku allows us to do that so in addition to that our actual command to run the server that would ch change slightly so it really is a little bit more kind of traditional as you might type into your command prompt uh, for the uh, gunny horn, gunny corn, um, or G unicorn, however you want to call this. Uh, normally it's uh, pronounced in those two different ways. So we're going to basically run this command. So what's going to happen is that Heroku is going to deploy this um, onto the server, and then eventually it's, the last thing that's going to happen is run this command, which is obviously going to run the server, which has Django, and that's going to obviously. Um, make it available online so 
let's just go ahead and WSGI um, application. So that's going to basically, that's the client that's basically going to start the application. So I would type that in if I was using Linux. Here I could type that in um, into my local machine and that would bring up the Gunnyhorn server. So what I need to do is bind um, the ports. So 0 0.0.0.0. .0. And this time we're going to send or give it a parameter or environment variable, sorry. So this environment variable, uh, Heroku is going to automatically apply and define the port that is going to run on. So that pretty much um, sets out a kind of a baseline here for Heroku to get your actual kind of container working and running. So yeah, there we go. That's pretty much all the commands that we need to change there. So next up, if you just head over to, if you haven't already got this in place, um, the Heroku CLI. So just uh, go ahead and download the CLI. That's what I'm going to be utilizing. Uh, so download and install this uh, CLI so you can utilize Heroku through your command line interface. That's uh, step number one. And then we can go ahead and just log in. Okay, so I've gone ahead and logged in to Heroku. Uh, so Heroku container login. So once you've downloaded that, if you are downloading the CLI, um, you might find that you need to restart Visual Studio Code to get that actually working. Um, so alternatively, use a command prompt if you're in Windows. So Heroku login, container login. That will probably bring up the uh, the window, the browser window to begin with. To begin with, and you can log in. And once you've done that, press OK, etc. It takes you back here, and you've got login succeed, succeeded. So now we're logged in. We now have access to our Heroku environments. So we want to now actually kind of deploy our container. So I just want to take a moment. We've got an application. We've set it up, and we set out the environment variables. I'll give you a brief overview of what those were. We're going to come back to that in a second. And then we made a Docker file, we created a, uh, a Docker image and we tested that out. So that's essentially what we've done. We've just logged into Heroku and now we're going to deploy our application to Heroku. Okay, so what I've done is I've gone into the environment variables and I'm just going to delete that because that isn't something, like I said earlier, that isn't something that you want to actually deploy. Um, we're going to actually set the environment variables uh, manually. We're going to inject it in. And I'm going to show you how to do that. That's the kind of the whole point here, um, that we don't actually set our keys and our passwords directly in our file system here or in our files. We don't store it in the file system. We're going to um, put that in um, or inject that in manually into our settings. So I've gone ahead and deleted the environment variables. And what I've also done is I've just put the environment variables back for our AWS storage. So I've just put that back as per normal. So I'll just close that and I have gone ahead and in the settings, I've just put back the secret key and debug. So I just don't want to do that it's one thing at a time. I'm just going to show you how to set the allowed hosts. Then you can go ahead and also then go ahead and set all the other settings. So I'm going to remove the environment, the environment. Uh, this is the application that we installed earlier. So I'm going to remove those settings. We're not going to need that anymore for this and I remove the import. So that leaves us with this here. So how we're going to set this up is that we're going to use the OS environ and then get. So this is important, uh, this bit here. So the get, so there's two methods here. We can use get and the parentheses, or we can not uh, use the parentheses. We can use the uh, brackets here. Uh, and that's another way of setting it up. But I think in Heroku, I'm not too sure if that actually works uh, very well. Um, but we're just going to use get. So this is the format. So we're going to use OS, environment, get, and then brackets. So this is uh, the environment variable that we're going to set up and inject into our server in a minute. OK, so now that has been set, we've configured the storage back to normal. We've configured the setting options here back to normal. So we're just going to give you a demonstration of this. Now we can actually deploy this to Heroku. So I'm just going to remove anything I've got here. Uh, OK. So I removed all the images. We're going to start from fresh. Now, the image we made earlier, that's not the actual image that we're going to deploy. Like you saw earlier where we um, uploaded an image to uh, the H Docker Hub, it's a similar process. We're going to prepare an image um, to deploy to Heroku. So the first thing we need to do 
uh, is once you've got the CLI downloaded, is do the Heroku create. Let's create a new project. So that's going to create a new app. This is the name of the app. So I'm just going to record that in my screen. So I recorded that. So now what we can go ahead and do is now do a push. So what's going to happen here is that we're going to create a new image. Um, the, the web is the keyword here. Uh, and you can see this is the application for, this is the application we built, just built in Heroku. So we're going to push our image across to there. So what's going to happen is that Heroku and uh, Docker are going to work together. They're going to create a new image uh, specifically to deploy to Heroku. And then we're going to deploy it to Heroku. And it's going to basically give them the, uh, the name web. So let's go ahead and do that. So that's going to take a couple of seconds to build. Now it is going to be utilizing the Docker file to kind of prepare and build uh, the image. Uh, so we can see in Docker now we've created this new image here, and that's now going to be deployed on Heroku. So this is literally the first stage. Now, because we know it's already working because we tested this image before, we know it should work on the server, right? So now it's been successfully pushed. It says now we need to release, but before we release, let's go ahead and actually set up an environment variable. So this is where we actually now utilize or inject an environment variable. So what we're going to do is just set up the allowed hosts. So like I said before, you can go ahead after this and set up all the rest in a similar way. So here we're going to use Heroku config add. So there's two settings, there's set and there's add. I don't think set works. Um, add is what you need here. So allowed hosts, I'm just going to allow all in this case. And then you see that I've then selected the application that we've just built um, that I want to apply that to. So I can go ahead and do that. And you can see now that's been applied. So that's an environment variable that's been set in the background that no one can find or see. Um, so we can now have a look at that saying that we can use a get config get to actually have a look at the environment variables for this application. You can see we've got one here. Uh, so that's how to apply and view your environment variables. Now, what you can also do in Heroku, uh, where's our application? Uh, is this one here, wasn't it? I think. Um, so what you can also do, or Dry Basin, so is go in and do this manually. So in our application here, in the settings, we can reveal the config here. So you can see what I've just set up here. So you can do this manually if you wanted to, um, or do it through the CLI. So now that's done, let's go ahead and release. So we do Heroku release here. So that's going to release the app ready for us to actually view. And you can see it's done, which means everything's working okay. So here you might have a problem. You might get a problem. That's not a problem. So we can go ahead and have a look at the Heroku logs. So this is going to show us like the back end of all the logs that we have. Um, so if I run that, you'll see that I can move them down. There's a certain amount of rows there from the back end of our log. Uh, if there is a problem, you can run that, but we don't need that. So let's go ahead now and actually have a look at our application. So obviously we could just go online and do it, or we can just use the Heroku open. So open that, so that'll open up in a new tab and there we go. So our application is working. So once you get everything lined up, it is really simple to deploy our application to Heroku using containers. Now there's a number of, thing, number of things that might go wrong here, most definitely. Um, but if you just follow those steps initially and then just work from there. So now you've got that in place. Now obviously apply that to all the other settings that you want to utilize. Now uh, we should be running, uh, if I go to the admin, we should be running, it might be working in here. Uh, yeah, you can see that we're still using AWS and that seems to be working absolutely fine. So everything um, that we've intended to set up is working absolutely fine. So we've gone ahead, we've created a Django application and we tested it in Docker. We created a Docker file, uh, just kind of a baseline file. And then we've gone ahead and we've spoken about environment variables. Hopefully you've got a kind of good grasp now of this idea of environment variables and how to set them and the importance of them. Um, and you now know how to actually then deploy a simple container or image onto Heroku. So it's definitely as easier to deploy this way than it is to set up the Heroku um, 
the application with a proc file, etc., utilizing the other method that I've shown before in, in other tutorials.